Yeah, okay. Hello. Um, hello. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> That's all right then. You can, you can move this that sounds closer okay. to you. No, no, just that. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, we're glad to see uh, such a lovely audience for the very first reveal of our cards by Kate Charlesworth. <laughs> <laughs> and we are Lavender Menace Queer Books Archive. Uh, Bob Orr and I'm Sigrid Nielsen, and we founded Lavender Menace Bookshop in 1982, uh, uh, down in 4th Street, uh, down a dangerous stair to the basement. Some of you may remember it. And we, uh, we ran it for uh, quite a few years with Bob and Raymond Rose ran West and Wild, and that was 15 years of the first LGBT bookshop, as we would call it now, in Scotland. And uh, two years ago, partly as a result of James Lay's play, Love Song to Lavender Menace, we came back together uh, and decided that we would create an archive because the books we sold are going out of print. Uh, some of them uh, are very hard to find now or cost uh, over a hundred pounds from secondhand dealers. And uh, we'll tell you a bit more about that uh, when uh, Kate has finished introducing her cards. You'll know that Kate Charles Charlesworth is the author and illustrator of uh, Sensible Footwear, A Girl's Guide. Uh, Lighthouse Bookshop launched it, uh, and we were there two years ago, and it's a cartoon history of uh, the last 50 years uh, of L LGBT life. 70. 70. <laughs> Plus uh, <laughs> her own. And I, I won't keep you waiting any longer. Uh, we're going to reveal these cards of six queer authors. And Kate, can you tell us about them? I will. Thanks, Sigrid. Um, well, first, first of all, actually, I'd like to thank... Uh, excuse I, I do apologize for reading from notes. We've, we've not got much time, and I can't afford to waffle. So I'm going to read from notes. Anyway, um, first of all, I'd like to thank... Um, thanks for coming, and thanks to Bob and Sigrid for inviting me to participate in the project, because I do so love an archive and books. Um, so it was a no-brainer. And um, although I wasn't in Scotland when Lavender Menace was in its first incarnation, I remember its successor, Western Wild. And uh, I also remember tweaking my then current book with Marcella Cameron in the audience there um, to make sure it was a nice prominent position in the shop. I'm sure all <laughs> authors did that. So. <laughs> um, anyway, we're, we're all living archives. So um, if you could see the um, progress flag, that would be marvellous. Um, so the six-colour pride flag was recently designed as the 12-colour um, progress flag, incorporating black and brown to represent um, people of colour, and the pale pink, pink and blue and white of the trans flag. And um, all these colours feature strongly in the lavender men menace images. The, the six you'll see here and a further six, which are as yet unreleased, haha, <laughs> which, which will form our banner of books and writers. And, and I'll apologize now for not including the intersex um, purple roundel and yellow ground from the Progress Flag's second version at this stage. Okay, well, so some of you may remember me as a cartoonist in the gay press when we had one, and, or in the mainstream press, so you'll see that these cards are rendered in a completely different style from um, that old stuff. Um, and it's a style partly born of necessity when I was making sensible footwear available at the back of the, sh back of the room for a modest price, um, which is a huge tome in which I had to draw an awful lot of recognisable people, heroes, villains and everyone in between. And not being a caricaturist, I didn't want caricatures anyway, frankly, but I needed a quick an effective way to, uh, to represent them. And so, and I enjoyed working in this way very much. Uh, it was partly drawn and partly digitized. So when Bob and Sybil 
um, approached me with this project, I was, I was delighted to have a, a series of new canvases to, to carry, carry on working in that style. So, um, along with each writer, each card incorporates the lavender menace in some form, um, the iconic eye logo, partially or, or even in its entirety, plus one of the author's books. The title choice was partly to determined uh, by me, actually, by, <laughs> by size, image size and quality, um, and most importantly for an archive or a library such as this, by age and authenticity. So, for the books, I used images of first editions or, or as good a vintage edition cover as I could find. So, um, if we could have the first uh, slide, and I will arrange my notes here. Great. Um, Tove Janssen, 1914 to uh, 2001. Finnish Swedish speaking author of the Moomin cartoon book series, children's book series, which I, um, she's most known for, but she was an illustrator, painter, anti-fascist. She had a huge life. Um, after various affairs with men in 1946, she first went over to the ghost side. Um, this was code, as, as homosexuality was illegal in Finland. And she met her, her life partner, Tulika Payatila, in 1956. I'm glad you told me how to say that. <laughs> I found it online, a sweet, uh, I, I found a Finnish <laughs> bloke saying it, it was great. Um, anyway, I came late to her work because, because I'd stupidly assumed that the, the Moomins were cosy kiddie books, and uh, so wrong. The adult themes and emotions, uh, and hard choices, separation, danger, and charm, and fun, and love, and beautiful drawings. Um, the summer book, which I chose to, to uh, accompany her is is a most well known adult fiction translated into into English. So the second card is um, E. M. E. M. Forster, um, uh, eighteen seventy nine to nineteen seventy, English novelist and essayist, author of Howard's End, A Room with a View, and Morris. Uh, he began work on his gay novel Morris er early, quite early in his career, in nineteen thirteen. It's, uh, retrospectively, retrospectively, it wasn't one of his best received works, and that's probably why. But he didn't believe it was publishable during his lifetime, not be just because it was gay, because it had a happy ending, and that would have been wildly controversial. His friends told him he was crazy to write a novel like that. Yep. Yep. And, but it was eventually pub published um, posthumously in 1971, and that, that is the cover of the first edition. So um, when, I was, when I was drawing him in this nice loose style I worked out, um, that was the only cheery image I could find of him. Uh, it was taken around 1917 when he was in Egypt and he was in love. So, uh, so next, next is Audrey Lord. Thank you. Um, 1934 to 1992. American poet, feminist, activist and memoirist, author of Zami, a new spelling of my name. Uh, she was severely short-sighted, but taught herself to read at the age of four. She described herself as a black lesbian mother warrior poet. She dedicated her life to confronting and addressing injustices of racism, sexism, classism, and homophobia. And she absolutely took no prisoners. So, next slide, please. Ah, uh, Yancey. <laughs> 1917 to 1964. English broadcaster, celebrity journalist, biographer and author of screamingly camp mystery novels. I've read them all, mostly. <laughs> Nancy was a self-proclaimed trouser-wearing character. She was never exactly out and never exactly in. <laughs> she was a huge presence in the media of the day. She would have been a, 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 an absolute celebrity now. And she was a regular on popular TV sh panel shows such as What's My Line, <coughs> um, where the host and panelists wore evening dress, you know, ga ball gowns for the women, black tie for the men, except Nancy, who always wore men's casual shirts and cable knit jumpers. 
<laughs> Apparently that was written into a BBC contract, I was told. On 1950s, British black and white, single channel TV, that's all there was. Nancy was living proof for queer people of all sorts that they absolutely weren't the only one in the world. And that included me when I saw her. <laughs> um, so the next slide is James Baldwin, the next card, I should say. 1924 to um, 1987, American novelist, essayist, playwright and civil rights activist. His writing career began in the last years of legislative segregation. Um, and in his work, he explored the psychological implications of racism for both the oppressed and the oppressor. This was a new way of, of looking at the whole thing. But Giovanni's Room, um, his novel published in 1956, was not ostensibly about race, but the, that is the undertow, I think. It was extremely controversial in its representation of gay relationships, and I believe parts of it still are ex quite, quite shocking. Um, the, 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 the mindset, and, and, and it was about shame and, and self-loathing in part, so that, that was a shocker. Anyway, we conclude with the rather fabulous Vita Sackville West, uh, 1892 to 1962, poet, novelist, gardener, and author of a secret memoir, of, I'm extremely passionate, of her love, passion, very gothic affair, with uh, um, Violet Keppel, which was found after her death by her son, Nigel Nicholson, and published as Portrait of a Marriage. Dashing, aristocratic Vita, occasional cross-dresser, lover of Virginia Woolf, in a lavender marriage with uh, writer and politician Harold Nicholson. She had many affairs with women, uh, most of whom Virginia, uh, Virginia seemed to consider a bit of a rough. This, this opinion included the likes of Hilda Matheson, who was head of the BBC Talks Department. That's, that was a bit of rough for Virginia Woolf. <laughs> well, it was pretty rough. I, I, Hilda interviewed Vita. The next day, Hilda was ill. Vita went to see her, supposedly to tell her she hoped she got better soon. And I can assure you that Hilda did get better soon. <laughs> <laughs> well. Anyway, uh, to conclude, our uh, run through our fabulous cards, if I say so myself. Um, as a friend of mine said, after reading Victoria Glendening's terrific biography, Vita, oh, what a terrible, what an awful woman. I want to be her. <laughs> <laughs> I could only concur. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Kate. I, I, Vita Sackville West is the way I, I got into this business. I was a backpack wearing tourist in 1973 and in the Edinburgh bookshop, uh, it was almost Christmas and there was a stack of portrait of a marriage uh, in hardback up to the ceiling, literally. Uh, it, uh, it was the bestseller of that season. Uh, things were changing a bit even though Nigel Nicholson, her son, uh, had to make it into the story of his parents' marriage. <coughs> uh, and I, I just looked up at it and thought, what is this about? And that was how I discovered Vita, and the rest is history. So uh, I, uh, do you think, Kate, that it might be fair to say that most of these people, if not all of them, uh, were menaces in some way? I do. <laughs> and, and, and I have to say, especially Nancy and Vita, they were dreadful. <laughs> I yeah. don't. I, I mean, just because you're queer, that's you're, you're auto whether, you, whether you like it or not, you're automatically a menace to society. You certainly were then, and for an awful lot of people, you, we are now, um, uh, uh, to terrible ends in some parts of the world. Ian e. Forster was a very gentle person, uh, but I would say that he spent his life deciding to become a menace. <laughs> he couldn't decide whether to publish the novel. Uh, his older friend said, you must be joking. His younger friend said, do it. Uh, so he sent the novel across America uh, in relays with his younger friends because it would have been a crime to send it through the post. Uh, but uh, I wonder, uh, Kate, uh, what do you think uh, Nancy would have said about being a menace? 
Um, I think she might have said, darling, I work very hard at it. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe if you're going to be a menace, be sure you do it on TV, yeah, <laughs> in plain sight. And she certainly did. And uh, if you ask Vita, I think uh, she'd say, if you're going to be a menace, do it traditionally. Because uh, that's why she did her gardening in a wide-brimmed hat, uh, as you can see in Kate's mm -hmm. card. Gold earrings, a pearl necklace, and knee boots. Yeah. And uh, I think being a menace traditionally is what this is all about. Because uh, in their day, there wasn't a tradition. There wasn't history. The stories were, uh, as Tova Janssen said, you were a ghost. And now we're able to be menaces together as the original Lavender menace did, menaces did. And we're able to tell our stories and uh, be a lot menacing or a little menacing every day. And uh, these cards are uh, for sale from Lavender Menace uh, on our merchandising page. They'll help us uh, hold events like this, uh, pay queer writers to come and hold events in Edinburgh. And uh, we need a space for these books as well, where they can be available to researchers and writers. And Bob is going to tell you now uh, how you can join the menaces and become one yourself. <laughs> Could I just say that? My mother thought I was a menace. <laughs> <laughs> Mine did <laughs> too. <last> day. <laughs> I like the idea that you you came up with earlier on, uh, Kate, about us wearing uh, purple and black striped tops <laughs> in the in the yeah. uh, vein of um, Dennis the Menace. Yeah. Que queering Dennis and yeah, queering menace. Dennis the Menace. Yeah, queering Dennis the Menace. I love it. <laughs> Could I have the slide up, please? For yeah, become become a. a, a, a a menace and donate or become a, a menace and support us because we're doing this on a shoestring at the moment but we know that there's lots of goodwill amongst the community and this is your chance now to um, make a one-off donation or a recurring donation um, and by going to that uh, website that uh, web page there or just going to the the front page of the uh, of lavendermenace.org.uk. Um, you'll be given a chance to subscribe, uh, which means that gives gives us a chance to build a, a mailing list, um, and and even leaving your address as well, which gives us a chance to send you freebies depending on how generous you are. <laughs> we we are we ha we have lots and lots of plans for the archive. Um, most of all, we're concentrating on events three or four times a year. Um, and we've started out by always offering people who take part a fee, which um, in the, uh, when we were running Lavender Menace and Western Wild, everything was done free. But nowadays, because things have moved on and because people have their own histories to tell, we feel that it's important that their, uh, not their, their, their knowledge is acknowledged, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, do, do have a, a look at the, um, the blurb that continues down the, the page. You can see it on your mobile as well. Um, can we go back to the um, shopping page as well? There's. That's a pretty good illustration. You can see that the cards are six pounds. You can buy them online with uh, postage inclusive in the UK. Um, and we're selling them on the stall ourselves too at the moment. And uh, our first freebie is going to be just for today. We're going to give the bookmarks away uh, to everyone who visits the stall. You can choose which one uh, suits you. I'll also mention our next event, which is next Thursday. It's an online event in cooperation with Edinburgh City Libraries. Uh, it's a film that's being made for us by Diane Barry. Uh, and it's a film interview 
with Bob Cant, the editor of uh, Footsteps and Witnesses, uh, Lesbian and Gay Life Stories from Scotland. He was the first to publish a book of Scottish oral history, and he could not get it reviewed except by Sarah Nelson of the Scotsman. This was 1993. And uh, it was republished in a new edition with new stories in 2008 uh, by Word Power, which became Lighthouse. And uh, we have a film interview with him and clips of four of his interviewees uh, who talk about uh, being in the book. And then we'll have a panel uh, Jamie Valentine of Our Story Scotland and Marriott of LGBTQ, uh, L LGBT Youth Scotland, who was one of the interviewers on the second edition, and Rowan Rush Morgan, and they are an archivist today. And uh, we don't have a, uh, an Eventbrite link for this yet, but we hope to have one on Monday. Uh, keep watching our sites, and uh, you, uh, you can register. Uh, this event is completely free. And thank you so much for coming. It's uh, really exciting for us uh, to bring the archive into another dimension and uh, reach more people with these writer's stories. And uh, with, uh, we hope we've been menacing enough for you. <laughs> Uh, we, our dream is to have it accessible at street level to anyone who wants to use it um, in a space of its own, in a safe space of its own, um, where the books are on display um, and not sort of stored away in boxes. Um, that's pr a pretty expensive dream um, because... Um, even uh, office space or shop space is quite expensive, so it might not be centrally, but that's our dream. But there might be other ways of doing it. There are institutions who are interested in housing the archive, but that keeps it more within an institution rather than uh, owned by the LGBT community. I'll go on from that to say that uh, safe space wasn't a phrase when we opened the bookshop, but that was essentially what we were doing, and people would come in and, and say, uh, this is such a gay space, as they said in those days. And one person put his head through the door in the very first year uh, timidly and, and said, oh, it's nice. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, that uh, we want to use our experience creating that type of space, which uh, in a way was, uh, we thought more about selling the books and circulating them, but that was a big thing about it. And we want safe space in real life, but also safe space online. We want, uh, we're already uh, cataloging the books on an app we have called Libib, and we want uh, short uh, information about the books to be available all over the world, a whole body of it. This is important in a way I didn't realize until I started blogging about Kate Millett, who, as uh, you'll know, wrote Sexual Politics. Uh, the rest of her life was a lot murkier, and it's now very hard to find reviews of some of her later books, such as Sita, because they were in print. And they were ne never digitized. You have to do a lot of research even to find that they're there. And uh, part of what I dream about for the archive is to create an online network where uh, 
writers and readers can find these reviews and comments and know what the world, uh, how it was reacting mm -hmm. to the books by these writers because that's the way the community was created. And we'd like you to explore using uh, this app on your phone called Libib and create your own collection of, of the books you have at home and share that collection with us. And mm -hmm. for any of the books that you particularly like is to leave, uh, is to write a comment or review yourself about it. So that way, what we can do is to build up a, um, an archive from the community upwards, which makes it much broader. We can only find, we can only record what we've actually got. But for other, uh, for, for most of you, you, you'll have books that we've maybe not seen or had forgotten about. So it's important that um, a, a digital, ar the, 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 the great thing about the digital archive is that it will be built up from the, from the community upwards. Thank you. I think we've got a couple of minutes to end on. Uh, luckily, you're sticking around. So if everyone wants to keep going, I'll pass those next ones. So you can find Robert and I in the corner over there where they will have the book racks and they have copies of the books and you can have a browse. And so we all join in the final one so that you can see one of the books. Thank you. Thank you.